Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mike, host of the free iTunes podcast, Psychiatric Secrets Revealed with Dr. Mike, but that's not why I'm here today. This is another Saving Savvy episode. This time we're going to do a review on another bridge camera. I said I wouldn't do any more, but here I am doing another one. This is the Panasonic FZ70, and I often say LZ when I mean FZ, so if I do that during this interview, please, or during this talk, please excuse me. So this is uh, Panasonic's Super Zoom camera. It has a 60x zoom, and the great thing about it is, is that it's kind of closing out or something, so you can actually get this camera. I got it for $218. When I started to compare this camera, what I really was doing was I was often comparing it to the last Super Zoom that I did a review on, which is this one here. This is the Fuji Fine Pix S1, and since I was comparing them so often, frequently I thought I would actually try to combine the points of the two cameras so I thought that might be useful to you it's kind of the way I was thinking about it but first we need to look at the elephant in the room which is that this camera definitely has some features that you don't typically see in super zoom cameras so let's go through them some of them are useful some of them are less useful so for instance it has an intervalometer which means it allows you to tell the camera for instance to take a picture every 30 seconds for 50 pictures or whatever kind of a time lapse thing you might use it i personally would not it also has some features that sound good but don't really seem to impact the overall experience of the camera so this has five axis image stabilization so most uh, image stabilizers are vertical and horizontal this will also do like roll and pitch um, I did not find that it really improved the quality of my still or video images, um, but maybe if I was on a boat or something, it might. So I kind of thought, well, it sounds good, but it really isn't impacting things much. Some things that you may find useful and that may be worth the additional premium cost of a new model camera is it has a flippy screen. People like flippy screens, so this one has one. It also has Wi-Fi, and that Wi-Fi allows you to control the camera from your smartphone or to download pictures to your smartphone, which is pretty cool. And the best feature, I think, is that it's weather seal, which is a first for this kind of a camera. So this is not immersible in water, but if it rains on it, or it snows on it, it's not going to fry itself. So that's a pretty cool feature. So those are the features that really distinguish it between the camera that we are going to review today um, and so you need to know that because that those things may be worth the additional costs um, for your particular needs but when we compare the camera in other areas well let's see how they pan out and this these are of course my personal opinions but i'm not getting paid by anyone and no one even gives me the cameras to review so it's as honest as i can be so what about displays well the Fuji has a over 900,000 dot display, which is excellent. Um, the Panasonic has an over 400,000 dot display, which is not as good, but still fine. You know, it's fine. Um, the electronic viewfinders, they both have them. This one has an over 900,000 dot electronic viewfinder. This one on the, on the Lumix is only over 200,000 dots, so that's a much cruder viewfinder. For general, just using it, it's okay, but it's not going to be nearly as detailed as the Fujifilm, and so the Fuji, we would say, is slightly better in that area. What about manual controls? Well, of course, they both have your basic manual controls, things like, you know, uh, shutter priority, aperture priority, you can, you have a hot shoe and fun stuff like that. But the Panasonic allows you to actually go into the software and adjust basic parameters in the camera um, much easier because the Fuji only has one function, assignable key. Panasonic, you can assign two different keys for function, and plus you have a quick menu button, so it's actually much easier to get in there and to get deeper into the menu to do things that if you're even a somewhat experienced photographer, you'll do more often. So we would say the Panasonic is slightly better in that regard. How about sharpness of the image? Both these cameras are super zoom cameras going out to an equivalent of 1200 millimeters. Um, and so to create a lens that goes from the 20s to 1200 
and to put it in a fairly inexpensive body with all sorts of other electronics is a tall order so you can't expect miracles and generally speaking super zoom cameras have a softer focus than other cameras because of that acceptable but softer so out of the two the Panasonic seems to do a lot of sharpening in its processor, um, and it looks very much like a traditional compact camera, you know, a little bit softer. The Fuji does less of that, it seems, and the images tend to be a bit softer than on the Panasonic. Both acceptable, but the nod would go to the Panasonic for uh, providing slightly sharper images. Well, how about color rendition? Again, they're both perfectly fine colors. Um, Panasonic has a more traditional color palette. Fuji cameras tend to be a little more vibrant. Their skin tones tend to be a little richer. And in my personal preference, I like the Fuji uh, color palette better than a lot of other cameras. So I would give the nod to the general color palette to the Fuji. How about HDR? Now, both of these cameras have an amazing ability to do HDR in camera. And what that means is the camera will take a, an exposure that's the right exposure, and then an overexposed image, and then an underexposed image of the same image. Combine them together so you have more detail in the shadows and you don't blow out the highlights. So what do I mean by that? Well, right now we're using a, a webcam to do this little review and if you look back over there that window is completely blown out i should be properly exposed if i look out that window i can see things perfectly well but the sensors in digital sensors just are not sensitive enough to have that kind of dynamic range by doing an hdr image by kind of using those different exposures the camera can simulate an image where you would see not only me for instance but you'd also see outside the window both do a fine job, actually, but I think the Fuji film does a pretty awesome job to the point that I kind of fell in love with that. If you look at some of my other reviews on this camera, you'll see me just kind of swooning over the HDR images, and so the nod goes to, this, to the Fuji for HDR images. How about distance focusing? So you're out at that 50 or 60x zoom. You're trying to focus on that bird that's flying around or in a tree or on a perch or whatever. They both stink. All right. And I think that's one of the fallacies of super zooms that you're going to take these on safari and, you know, go 50x out and get these fabulous pictures. These cameras absolutely need to be on tripods when they're at that extended range. The other option is you take a gazillion pictures and you hope that a couple of them are in focus. So, um, so long range zoom is not good on either, despite the fact that that's the selling point of these cameras. Unless you're going to be on a tripod and you have plenty of light and you take a bunch of pictures, you probably will be disappointed with both of them. Well, speaking of tripods, um, the Panasonic has a traditional metal tripod mount, which is good and durable. But for some reason, this very expensive Fuji cheaped out with a plastic one, which can strip out. And um, that's kind of inexcusable because that's a very inexpensive part. Uh, probably thinking that, I don't know, why, I have no idea why they did that, but they did do it. It's stupid. Um, and uh, so tripod mounts goes to the Panasonic. What about in-camera editing? Both of these cameras will allow you to do some simple editing after you take the picture. The Panasonic will let you do more. So you can, for instance, apply a filter, um, like turn a picture into, I don't know, like a black and white or sepia or something after you've actually taken it. You can straighten a picture um, in the Panasonic and do other things. And although the Fuji will let you do some things, the Panasonic just lets you do more. If that's important to you, most of us do our editing in a computer, not in the camera. But if that's important to you, the Panasonic edges out there a little bit. Uh, what about tweaking? So so on a lot of DSLRs, you can actually go in and adjust the basic parameters of your shooting. You can say, I want my pictures to have more contrast, or I want my pictures to have greater sharpness, or more or less color, or whatever. Um, you can't do that in most point-and-shoot cameras, obviously, 
and the Fuji is no exception, not a lot of user controls, where the Panasonic really gives you tons of controls and even gives you a lot of controls um, when you're in more automatic modes to make changes. So in that case, I would say the Panasonic edges out the Fuji. Um, how about high ISO performance? ISO, uh, basically, it, you're adjusting the sensitivity of the sensor. So one of the big problems with small sensor cameras, like both of these, these both have the sensors that are the size of like a compact camera. And especially when you put in 16 million pixels on them, you should have less pixels on those little tiny sensors. Um, but when you get in your, when you're getting to higher and higher gain on that sensor, in other words, trying to use that sensor at lower and lower lights, you get a lot of noise, a lot of, um, computer effects to try to make the noise look less, so you get a lot of smearing, less dynamic range. So neither of these cameras are phenomenal. They both show noise at very, very low ISOs, but it's okay. And you can get a pretty decent image even with an ISO up to about 800. Um, when you get up to about ISO 1600, you can probably get postable images from both cameras. Um, and when you get up to an ISO of 3200, things get a little hairy in both cameras. Um, if you take enough shots, you'll probably get a couple that you can use and maybe even post. Um, when it comes to doing that, you get more postable shots with the Fuji than you do with the Panasonic. So the Fuji edges out just barely on the ISO test. Focusing for just regular stuff, I'm not talking about the distance focusing, which again is crappy, but we're talking about just your, you know, taking a normal picture is quick and speedy for both cameras. I think you'll be happy with that. How about the grip? Well, this is the grip part here, perfectly fine on the Panasonic, but the Fuji gives you this super de duper, very deep grip, which feels much more secure so when it comes to the grip and even the feel of the camera, I would say Fuji has a slight advantage. How about video? Well, mixed bag, all right? The Panasonic shoots 1080 interlaced. The Fuji shoots 1080 progressive. 1080 progressive is a better video. However, the Fuji has, sometimes does some weird stuff with exposure, which I showed on a previous video. And the Panasonic has more manual controls than the Fuji does. We'll call it a draw. Uh, neither of these are cameras that you would do a Hollywood production on, but they're fine for the kids recital or something like that that you'd want to record. Microphones actually work pretty well in both of the cameras and they handle um, things with a lot of transients like music quite well, so they're awesome. But don't expect anything like mic jacks or earphone jacks. They just don't come on these particular cameras, um, but they're fine for family stuff. How about um, zoom range? All right, this one is a 60x zoom. This is a 50x zoom. Does that mean that the 60x zoom will get you closer to your subject? No, because zoom has nothing to do with well, indirectly, but it has nothing to do with magnification. Zoom is how far the lens goes from its widest aperture to its most telephoto. And the Panasonic goes from 20 millimeters to 1200 millimeters. So 1200 millimeters is the telephoto. The Fuji goes from, I think, about 24 or 25 millimeters to 1200 millimeters. So it's a 50x zoom because that 25 is roughly like 50 times and this is 60 times. So they both end at the same point. What you do get is the Panasonic will be a little wider at its widest range. And that could be useful if you're taking a scene of a large group of people or a big landscape, but four millimeters will make a difference so a slight edge goes to the to the Panasonic, at least in the wide angle department. So there you have it. And so basically, again, if you're not looking for the razzle dazzle features that this new Fuji Fine Picks S1 offers, you get a very similar experience 
with a much now much less expensive camera. I think this was around four hundred dollars when it was introduced. Um, if you need the razzle dazzle, especially like the weather ceiling, then you're going to pay the price. But you get a very nice quality camera, um, no articulated screen, and you know it's not it's, it's not doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but it has most of them, and it is all the fun toys that people want. So you'll have the special filters, the panorama, the big zoom, some manual controls, all that kind of stuff that you're going to to want as a consumer. So um, I would say make your decisions, and uh, you can't go wrong either way. And if you get some time please give my podcast a listen. It's called Psychiatric Secrets Revealed with Dr. Mike, and it's on iTunes and other places. And I know everyone else on YouTube says this. I never say it, so I'm going to say it now. And please subscribe so I make more videos if you want to see them. Take care. Bye.